Now, I have my favorite apple. This is my Newton apple. And I want to tell you the anatomy of the atom first, as described by Rutherford. And then I will give you a series of experiments in which he concluded that this was the correct model. Often professors do it the other way around. They go through a whole series of experiments, and then by the time everybody's really lost, you say, aha, and these experiments apply this model. So I'll give you the model to begin with. Um, we'll do a little mental gymnastics. Let's take this apple, and we'll, we'll make it the size of the Earth. So you can imagine, it's one big apple. Now the question is, if you look inside the apple, what are the size of the atoms inside of an apple which is the size of the Earth? And it turns out the average size of the atom is about the size of a cherry. All right. So here we pluck out the cherry, and we look inside the cherry, and um, you have to use a little imagination here, and you don't see anything. It looks empty. So you say, well, the cherry's a little too small. Let's blow it up the size of a basketball. You don't see anything either. All right, let's blow it up the size of a tennis court. If you look very carefully, you begin to see something in the middle. So, oh, heck, let's, let's blow it up the size of a football coliseum. And now you see something inside. You see a little pebble. And you see nothing else except you see a cloud of smushed electrons going around. So virtually, it's all empty. And what's in the center is what we call, and every school child knows, a nucleus. And it's positively charged. Now very soon after Rutherford devised this model, based on very, very sound experiments, his close colleague, Chadwick, discovered the neutron. So inside the atom, you have a bundle of protons, and the positive charge is neutralized by the neutrons. So this is the model that he devised, and it's a model that we use today. But at the time he began his experiments, his boss, J.J. Thompson, was the first one to propose what we call, what he called, the rice pudding model of the an atom. My father never liked to eat rice pudding, so he liked watermelon, so he called it the watermelon model. But the same thing, that you have positive and negative charges distributed everywhere. And this was the ruling model at that time. Rutherford was interested in this discovery by another colleague named Henri Becquerel, who discovered radioactivity really quite accidentally. He had inherited some uranium salts from his dad, and his dad was a photographer, and you use uranium salts to enhance photographs at that time. And he had the uranium salts in the same drawer where he had a lot of photographic plates, unexposed photographic plates with black paper. And when he tried to use the photographic, he noticed that they were d badly damaged, as if they had been exposed to light, all of them. And then he made the really interesting conclusion that perhaps something in the dark door from the uranium salt exposed the film. Now, he had a little basis of thinking that, because just at that same time, in 1895, Wilhelm Röntgen in Germany, using the cathode ray tube developed by J.J. Thompson, Rutherford's professor, discovered x-rays, that there was radiation coming from a tube. When you electrified it, you had a cathode and an anode, and you could expose film or get scintillations on a fluorescent screen. So he made the jump, he said, aha, what's coming out of his uranium salts is the same what came out of this cathode ray tube done by Runken. And actually, he was wrong. 
but it started a lot of excitement because it was easy to do the experiment. All you just take the salt and, um, but it wasn't as powerful as x-rays. In, in the first x-rays that Rumkin did, you could take your hand, shine an x-ray through it, and the photograph that you see now is the most, one of the most famous ones. You see the wedding ring on the hand, and everyone just been bananas over that. Um, Rutherford decided that he would look a little further into what Madame Curie had called radioactivity. So he took a block of lead, bored out a hole in the middle, and dropped a little bit of salt, uranium salt, at the bottom, expecting that whatever radiation came from the salt would come out of the top of the block. And you can see in this picture that they had three types of rays. You had one ray who went to the left, you had one ray that went to the right, Rutherford named those alpha and beta, and another ray that went straight up. The reason that they were bending is because Rutherford cleverly put a magnet with the north and, pole, north and south pole of a magnet perpendicular to the direction of the rays. So he could determine that with the magnet, that what went left were positive, turned out to be alpha particles, what we now know as alpha particles, the bare nucleus of helium, and what went to the right were the negative electrons. And later on, one of his colleagues found that what went straight up was the same type of wave that Röntgen had discovered in Germany, the X-ray, but this time in a much stronger way called gamma ray. So now he had a method. Rutherford had a method of capturing the radiation in a very specific way. So he decided to do the following experiment. And it's an experiment, actually, given that you had a little radium, that any school child could do in school, you know, compared to the experiments we do today. He had a little radium, he had a lead screen with a little hole through it, and through the little hole, he had the alpha particles come from. You remember the alpha particles being the bare nucleus of helium. Then he had various sheets of foil, of metallic foil like gold and tin, steel, very thin, and the alpha particles would go through. Again, with your mental gymnastics, if the atoms in the foil was like the watermelon, with an dist even distribution of negative, positive, negative, positive charges every place, you would expect the positive alpha particle, which is fairly large and heavy, it's two neutrons and two protons, to mostly go straight through and behind, he had a fluorescent screen in which every time the particle hit the screen, you got a little blip. But a little bit to his astonishment when he did the experiment, he got a lot of scattering. He got alpha particles, which mostly went straight through, but some of them were strongly deflected. And occasionally, one alpha particle almost came back and hit him in the nose. That was a bit of an exaggeration. But Rutherford was astonished. He says it's as if you took a tissue paper and shot a cannonball at it, and the tissue paper would throw it back to you. And from that experiment, he concluded that the only way you could explain this data is that all the positive charges must be concentrated in one place, i.e., what we now as a nucleus. So the structure of the atom that Rutherford proposed, the anatomy of the atom, if you wish, with a nucleus in the center, bunch of electrons on the outside, looks very similar to our solar system, when we have the sun and a series of planets, eight or nine planets, depending on how you count. But in the solar system, you have attractive forces that the planets, gravitational forces, and the sun hold them together. But in the experiment, in the scattering experiment Rutherford did, 
you have a big, heavy alpha particle coming in to a rather, this is what we're proposing, dense positive nucleus. But the unanswered question, which Rutherford wanted to answer, was in the solar system, there are attractive forces. But in the atom, there will be repulsive forces because it's the positive alpha and the positive nucleus. And it turns out mathematically, and this is the mathematics, which is a little bit beyond you, and it's beyond me. It's quite sophisticated mathematics. You can predict whether the scattering pattern on the screen behind suggests that there are attractive forces, like in the solar system, or repulsive forces, like we're proposing in an atom. Attractive forces would give you elliptical orbits, and the repulsive forces hyperbolic orbits. When he did the experiment, plotted the data in which you had the number of scintillations, meaning the number of little bright lights on the fluorescent screen, as a function of the angle of scattering, it exactly fit the theoretical curve that you would expect by repulsion. And so that was a sort of the final brick in his model.